Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thanks so much for being here tonight. Uh, my name is Michael Burroughs, and I serve as director of the Kegley Institute of Ethics, um, located here at CSU Bakersfield. And we are honored to be the host organization uh, for tonight's event. Uh, this is our 18th annual Kegley Institute of Ethics fall lecture. Um, so we have quite a tradition, and tonight we're very honored um, to have Dolores Horta be our featured speaker in this lecture series. So we're all in for a treat. Thanks for being here. Um, at this time, um, I'd like to thank uh, CSUB President Dr. Lynette Zelezny for being with us as well, and invite her up for some welcoming comments uh, to our audience. Thank you very much, Dr. Burroughs. It's an honor to be here. Good evening to all and a very, very warm welcome. On behalf of the entire Roadrunner family, I offer a warm welcome to California State University Bakersfield for the 2022 Kegley Institute of Ethics Fall Lecture. Tonight is an especially special occasion at CSUB. We are honored to welcome a champion for freedom and equality, who is perhaps the most respected and influential civil rights leader in the world today. But Dolores Huerta is more than a national treasure. Here at CSUB, she is family. Like Dolores, so many of our students, faculty, and staff trace their roots to the fields of Kern County, the top crop producer in the nation. We are proud that our labor feeds the world, but we are proud that their dignity is our work. And we are proud that the movement born right here in our fields continues to inspire people all over the world to advocate on behalf of freedom, equality, and justice. There is a picture of our beloved Dolores that has become iconic over the decades. I recently saw the original, which is in the National Portrait Gallery. It's a 1965 photo in the Delano grape strike and boycott. A woman stands alone, high above a crowd, holding a sign over her head that bears a single word, Welga. In one image, we see a woman standing alone against incredible, powerful opposition and urging courageously her fellow workers to action. That picture was taken 57 years ago, but it could have been taken just yesterday because Dolores is still urging us forward. And she's doing it by the power of her own example, her own fierce determination to fight for what is right. I want to thank the Kegley Institute of Ethics for hosting this important lecture and providing thought-provoking discourse and conversation since 1986. And a very special thank you to the sponsors of this evening's lecture, Valley Strong Credit Union, Adventist Health, Bakersfield, Kaiser Permanente, and of course, the Kegley family. And thank you. What a great crowd that's here tonight to hear Dolores. We want to thank our students, our faculty, our staff, the entire community for supporting this vital programming, and we appreciate your engagement in the conversation tonight. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Zelezny. So I'd like to invite up a special guest to introduce our speaker tonight. Um, and that special guest is Connie Perez Andreessen. Connie serves as Chief Administrative Officer and National Vice President of the United Farm Workers of America. She is also an alumna of CSU Bakersfield. She graduated magna cum laude in 2000 with a bachelor's degree in business administration and a concentration in accounting. And she means, it maintains a strong connection with our university to this day. She currently serves as vice chair of the CSUB Foundation Board 
as a member of the CSUB President's Latinx Advisory Board. And she was also, just this year, inducted into the CSUB Hall of Fame for her many accomplishments. If I were to list all of her accomplishments, we'd be up, I'd be up here all night. Um, and I know that's not what you want, but I'll just say a few. Um, she was named uh, the Businesswoman of the Year by the Kern County Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and also named a Woman of Excellence by the National Latina Business Women's Association, amongst many other honors. So thank you, Connie, for joining us and for formally introducing uh, our speaker tonight, uh, and also just for serving as an inspiration to our students and community. So welcome, Connie. Good evening, and thank you to CSU Bakersfield and the Kegley Institute for hosting tonight's event. As Michael mentioned, my name is Connie Perez Andreessen. I am the Chief Administrative Officer and National Vice President of the United Farm Workers, which Dolores co-founded. It is an honor to be here today to introduce a mentor and a friend. I'm standing here today because of the many sacrifices Dolores has made throughout her life for our farm worker community. I grew up at the Woodville Labor Camp in Tulare County, surrounded by farm workers and their children, until I was 17 years old. My father was a member of the UFW and would often talk about Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta and his trips to the 40 acres in Delano. As a child, I did not realize how these conversations would impact my life for many years to come. I never imagined attending college or graduating, but when I learned that Dolores had graduated from a community college in the 50s, which was rare for Mexican American women at the time, something in me began to dream of someday also graduating from college. I attended Porterville and Bakersfield College and graduated with honors from Cal State Bakersfield. I am only one of thousands of children that have graduated from college because of all the work Dolores has done over the years so that the children of farm workers could have this opportunity. Prior to joining the UFW, I was a partner at one of the largest CPA firms in Kern County. After 15 years with the firm, I left because I was unhappy with what I was doing and I knew I needed to come back to Kern County and help my farm working community. Since joining the UFW in 2017, I have never been happier with what I'm doing and I hope that I'm lucky enough to reach the age of 92, like Dolores. <laughs> and still be advocating for my community. At every stage of my life, I have always looked at Dolores' life for guidance and inspiration. I'm not a mother of a five-year-old, Valentina, and realize just how much Dolores sacrificed to help our community. I want to thank her children, Camila, because I know it was not easy to not always have your mom around. I was part of the 24-day, 335-mile pilgrimage from Delano to Sacramento in August to encourage the governor to sign AB 2183, which he eventually did. Yeah. Wow. Dolores was there, and it was an honor to be part of history with her. I left my daughter behind, when I came, behind and when I came home, I was heartbroken to see how much my absence had affected her. She developed anxiety and suffered for weeks from separation anxiety. She's doing much better now, but it again made me realize just how much Dolores has sacrificed for us. There were not many Latina women in positions of power when Dolores co-founded the United Farm Workers. Today, the UFW has a majority women board our president, 
our President Teresa Romero is the first Latina and immigrant woman to become president of a national union in the United States. There are many elected officials in Sacramento and DC that can tie their roots to Dolores Huerta and the farm worker movement. We even have Julie Rodriguez Chavez at the White House. Thank you, Dolores, for all the doors you have opened to make this possible. Dolores, I stand on your shoulders. My life and career is just a small part of your legacy. So to those of you in the audience, I just want to say you're more connected to the history of our community than you think. And there is much to do here for the farm workers who feed us as ever. Don't let tonight be a history lesson. Get involved. Vote next Tuesday if you haven't already, and encourage others to vote. And please reach out to the United Farm Workers and the Dolores Huerta Foundation. Join us. Dolores helped start us, but we're counting on you to help us continue. With that, please welcome my good friend and mentor, Dolores Huerta, co-founder of the United Farm Workers, a champion for women, immigrants, Latinas, and so many others, and a testament to the grit and spirit of our community. Thank you, and si se puede. Uh, thank you very much for that beautiful introduction, Connie. Thank you. And th thank you, President Zelensky, also, uh, because we owe you so much. You have done so much uh, to bring Cal State Bakersfield into the community, okay? Let's give her a big applause, everybody. Yay. And thank you, Mr. Burroughs, also, for inviting me to uh, give this, uh, this talk today. It's really interesting, you know, I speak all over the country, but I have to tell you, I'm very nervous here, okay? <laughs> and I just got, got off of a plane coming from Nevada uh, where I was campaigning in Nevada right there, over there for the elections. And I was really lucky to be with John Legend, Elizabeth Warren, and President Obama. <laughs> and I kind of wanted to share my story. A lot of people know about my work with United Farm Workers, but they don't know that actually uh, Cecil and myself uh, really learned about organizing in another organization called the Community Service Organization, CSO. And way back there, uh, in, I'm gonna go way back, okay? In the 50s, we had a chapter here in Bakersfield. And I think maybe some of you might know some of the folks that were involved at that time. Uh, but that is actually where my activism began, in the CSO. And uh, what the first thing that we learned, and I have to mention his name. Some of you may know of him. His name is Fred Ross Sr. Fred Ross Sr. And he is actually the one that taught both Cesar and myself how to organize, and many other organizers. And people don't know his name because he was such a great organizer, Okay. Yeah, because when you're an organizer, it's not about you. It's about the people that you empower. That, that is what being an organizer is. And of course, sometimes, and when people talk about what is leadership, leadership is that you empower other people. That you empower other people. That's what, that's what it's all about. And in that organization, we passed a lot of laws that really help benefit the Latino community. So way back in the early 60s, we passed a law that you could get your driver's license in Spanish. You could vote, you could vote in Spanish. These are the laws we passed, okay? Uh, another important law that we have here in California that they don't have in Texas, in 1963, we passed a law that anybody who was a citizen could register another person to vote that you did not have to find a deputy registrar out there somewhere uh, to assign you up to be able to vote. In Texas today, 
they still have that law. So many people in Texas don't get registered to vote. And not only that, but they make it very punitive. If somebody who's a deputy registrar makes a mistake, they can actually be punished. And so this makes it very, very scary for many people in Texas. Another important law that we passed, if you were a legal resident of the United States of America, if you had your green card, you could get public assistance. And there were many elder people, it was very hard for them to, to become citizens at that time. And even though many of them, their children had gone off to war during World War II, uh, but they couldn't get any kind of an old age pension, disability, et cetera. Well, we passed that law. And today in the United States, there's probably, be about, there's probably about 15 million people who are legal residents of the United States, but they can get public assistance, including aid to needy children. Aid to needy children. Another law that we passed at that time, and uh, I think California and Hawaii, and maybe now New York, are the only ones that have this law, is disability insurance for farm workers. So if a farm worker gets sick outside, outside of the job, that they can actually uh, uh, collect uh, some type of payment uh, to uh, you know, get them to the hard times. And even undocumented people, by the way, are able to qualify uh, for this particular uh, benefit that we have. <laughs> so, now, after I, my first meeting with Mr. Fred Ross, and he talked about what we could do when we got together, you know, growing up, like many of us, and especially back there in the 40s and the 50s, there was a lot of racism in our high schools. Uh, when we were coming back home from a, a football game or a basketball game, the police would stop us. They would search us. I actually opened up a teenage center because my mother was a, a businesswoman. She had a friend, a friend who had a storefront. So I said, well, we'll, we'll make that into a teenage center. So we got, some, we got uh, table tennis, we got a jukebox, uh, uh, we played all kinds of games in there, had dance contests. Back then, they called it the jitterbug. <laughs> and, uh, and we were doing just having such a great time, and the police shut us down. And you know why? Because they did not want to see Anglo girls hanging out with Filipinos and Mexicans and blacks. They don't like to see that. So they shut us down. So we moved our teenage center to, uh, uh, actually we had a friend who was a Methodist minister. And he said, you can bring your center over to my, to my church. And so we went over to his church and then we had more space. You know, people could actually play basketball, etc. And guess what? The police shut that one down too. They shut that one down too. And he actually had to move out of town this all happened in Stockton, California, where I was raised. And so growing up, you know, I always had that anger. What can you do? You didn't, you didn't think that you could do anything. But, after, but when I went to my first house meeting with Fred Ross Sr., then he showed us what we could do, that we could actually make the changes by getting together, by taking direct action, civic action, direct nonviolent action, by getting out there, registering people to vote, getting them to vote, voting for the right people, and this is how you make the changes. It sounds simple, doesn't it? I call it Democracy 101. <laughs> and knocking on those doors is so important, and I hope everybody here has already done that at some point in time. If you don't, now is a great time to do it because we have elections coming up in six days, right? Perfect time to do it. And the thing about going, knocking on a door and talking to somebody that you don't know, what does this mean? It gives you the emotional fortitude because when you're talking to strangers and you're trying to convince them to do something like registering to vote or to vote, you know, it, it really takes a lot of uh, psychic energy, you might say, and it, it's kind of scary when you're talking to people, but actually, I have to say that that was the beginning of my activism. Going out there, knocking on doors, getting people to register to vote, and getting people to vote. And the one thing about being an activist is that we all have a lot of our own personal problems, you know, it's here in school with the students, or 
in the community or in your personal life. But the one thing about being an activist is that you focus your energy on what you're trying to accomplish. And all those problems that we have, you know what? They're going to be taken care of one way or the other, OK? But the thing is that you're focusing on what you're trying to do, on the change that you're trying to make. And that really, you know, it really helps a lot in terms of your own personal problems. Now, uh, Helen Keller, you know, she said that there is an illness that human, and this, I'm going to paraphrase this, not in her exact words, but there is an illness that we have in human beings that scientists have not been able to cure. And that is apathy. That is apathy. And we see this so often in people because they don't feel that they have power. They don't feel that they can make a change. But once they become activists, it changes. And I want to give you a few examples. When we started organizing with the Dolores, well, first of all, we united farm workers, and a lot of people know what happened there, how we were able to convince people to go on strike. Now, a lot of people think, when we had that major strike in 1965, that somehow Susser walked through the fields and everybody went on strike. Didn't happen like that. Following what we had learned in the community service organization, we had house meetings with farm workers for three years, for three years before that strike, meeting in people's homes, because the farm workers were afraid. They knew that they would be fired if anybody knew they were organizing for a union. So we called ourselves the National Farm Workers Association so the growers wouldn't know that we were organizing a union. And we were actually going to organize for two more years, but the Filipino brothers, under the leadership of Larry Eatleong, whom, by the way, I organized Larry Eatleong, claimed to fame. <laughs> and uh, so they went on strike ahead of time. So we had to make a decision. Do we support them? And we knew that the majority of the farm workers were actually Latinos. So, but we had to make a decision. So we decided, but then they were treated so brutally by the growers. You know, they, in the labor camps, they cut off the light, the gas, and the water. So they didn't even have water to drink. And so, you know, we took a vote and we decided we had, we had to support the Filipino workers on their strike. And that became the famous Delano Grape Strike. And of course, and many of you probably know this story already, but we never would have won that strike had it not been for the 17 million Americans out there who didn't buy grapes, okay? Didn't buy grapes, didn't buy lettuce, didn't buy a gallon of wine. And I know we have one person here in our, our audience, Mr. Lerma, whose family was one of the first family uh, there in Corcoran that signed up for the Farm Workers Union, and he's still active. <laughs> so that's really good. So, uh, after I left the United Farm Workers in the year 2002, and this is something that Cecil and I had talked about, was um, about going back to the community, doing the kind of work that we had done in the community service organization. Well, I, I felt that the Farm Workers Union, we had the laws, we had the agricultural labor relations law, we had the structure, we had good organizers, and when I left, I felt that I had to pass that on to a younger person, because uh, when Cesar passed away, I was 65 years old. I didn't know how long I was going to live. My mother died at 51. My father died in his seven, early 70s. And so I thought we had to pass the baton on to a younger person. And so I advocated for Arturo Rodriguez to become the president of the union. I stayed with the United Farm Workers for nine years after Cesar died. But then I left and started to go back to, as I said, uh, going back to grassroots community organizing. Uh, telling poor people, many of them immigrants, that they had the power to make the changes in their communities. And I just want to uh, tick off on some of the changes that have been made by the Dolores Huerta Foundation. How many uh, people know where Lamont is? Everybody. <laughs> well, and our, our Dolores Huerta Foundation chapter in Lamar, and by the way, we call ourselves Vecinos Unidos. That means Neighbors United, right? Neighbors United. 
So in the in Le Mans, uh, our chapter there in Le Mans, they were able to get 14 streets with sidewalks, curves, and gutters. They were able to get and reconstruct the swimming pool that had been destroyed. Uh, they were able to get signs on some of the streets that didn't have signs. We had uh, murals that our youth group did there in, in Lamont and uh, several mur murals that they did. Um, they were also, oh, and then right next to Lamont is Wheat Patch, right? So in Wheat Patch, they were also to get more, they were able to get more signs and they were also to get a, a brand new gymnasium in Wheat Patch. You know, they went door to door, they got people signed up, they passed a bond issue. And they're, they're, the gym in Wheat Patch is uh, state of the art. Many of the schools from Bakersfield also, also take their teams to Wheat, Wheat Patch because it is such a great, gymna great gymnasium. Oh, they got a neighborhood park over there in Wheat Patch that they didn't have before. Okay, then they did something else. They got themselves elected to different positions. The Recreation Board right now in Lamont has two of our vecinos, two or three of our vecinos that are still on their board. Uh, one of our vecinas, her name was Leticia Prado, she got herself elected to the school board. And they were trying to take away the breakfast program from the farm worker children. So Leticia got rid of the person uh, that was trying to take away the, the breakfast program, and they kept the breakfast program. <laughs> She got herself elected then to the water board, and when she got elected to the water board, she found that there was about $250,000 missing from the fund of the water board. So she called in the grand jury so they could in, in, investigate and see where that money went to. You know? uh, of course, she paid the price because they went after her. She's not on the water board anymore, or the school board, but she's still out there fighting, okay? But, so this is what it's all about. It's about getting people to become activists and getting people to take power. And this is the main thing that we do with the organizing work that we do to convince people that they have the power to change things, that they don't have to wait for someone to come and do it for them. And as a matter of fact, if they wait for somebody to come and do it for them, it may never happen. So I want to talk a little bit more about Weed Patch. Anybody here from Weed Patch? Nope. Okay, well, it's right next to Lamont. <laughs> so Weed Patch happens to be a very historic place because that is where the Grapes of Wrath was filmed. You know, the famous Grapes of Wrath. And I hope everybody has seen that movie, and you haven't, you should see that because it is, it is very historic, and it's about Kern County. You know, Jane Fonda, I mean, not Jane Fonda, Henry Fonda was there. Yeah, Jane visited there recently. But Henry Fonda was there. Woody Guthrie was there. John Steinbeck, who wrote the book, was there. Very classic. Well, what happened after the Grapes of Wrath came out? Well, they celebrated in Kern County because the farmers, the growers, they had a book burning. They had a book burning of the book of the Grapes of Wrath. And if you wanted to check out the Grapes of Wrath at the, at the library, Kern County Library, it was behind lock and key until the 50s. You could not get that. Well, we're thinking that, that was a long time ago, right? What does that have to do with today? Well, I have a button here that says, I read banned books. <laughs> <laughs> And just a couple of weeks ago, at the community college, uh, there's a, an, an organization called the Liberty Institute. And they uh, wanted to make sure that at the community college here in Bakersfield, that they would not teach about the Farm Workers Union. God forbid that they should use, have the name Cesar Chavez, you know, as a curriculum at the community college, or myself. Luckily, I think that justice prevailed, and they were not, uh, well, their request was, was voted down, okay? So that's a little bit, a bit of a victory. <laughs> so when we think about that, here we are, 
you know, that, that book was written, I think, in the 30s, you know, and that here we are, and people are still trying to kind of keep people in ignorance in our society. With everything that we're going through, the one thing that we do know is that we need to have good education. We have to have a good education. Just recently, I started reading this book called The Open Veins of Latin America. Has anybody here read that book? Oh, I see a few hands. And it's kind of interesting, as I was reading that book, and I was thinking, because this is about the exploitation of Latin America, how they took all of the gold and the silver and everything that they could, you know, the jewels, you know, out of Latin America. And where did they send it to? They sent it to, to Europe. And this is how Europe became such a wealthy, uh, wealthy nations. I'm going to say wealthy nations because of the exploitation of Latin America. And not only the minerals and the gold and the silver, but the people. Because it was the people that they enslaved that actually made Europe a prosperous, prosperous nations. And when I was reading that book, and I was thinking of when you think of the way that those natives looked, the indigenous people of Latin America, and here in North America also, okay? And, and you thought, and then I thought, of course, then they brought in the African slaves, right? To continue to build that wealth. And I was thinking, the people that are in our prisons today, the people that are in poverty in our nations today, they're the same faces. They are the same faces as the indigenous people that were exploited and enslaved by the, by the conquerors, by the conquistadores. And that was back in the 1400s, right? How many centuries ago? 500 years? And we see that somehow the people, the indigenous people, are still in poverty. And you might say some kind of enslavement in our society. When we look at our, uh, when we look at our jail system, you know, right here from Bakersfield to Sacramento, over 20 prisons that have been built in one university, the University of Merced. When we see that the budget for our high schools is actually smaller than the corrections budget. The corrections budget for prisons is, is, you know, our high school budget is smaller. Corrections budget is higher. When we see that someone who works in corrections in a prison can earn more money than a teacher. And you don't have to have a master's degree or a PhD to work in corrections, right? You know what I mean? So, and these are our tax dollars at work. So we can see then that this is wrong. This is upside down. And so, you know, one of the things that we do with the Dolores Huerta Foundation is working on stopping the school-to-prison pipeline. The school-to-prison pipeline. And as many of you know, that we sued the Kern High School District because they had actually, and I'm thinking of the year, Camila, remind me. In 2009, yeah. They had actually expelled 2,500 mostly black and brown students from the Kern High School District. Right here, right here in Bakersfield. Well, after our lawsuit, that number has gone down to from 20, over t about close to 2,500 to 21, okay? So progress has been made. And uh, they also have to have, uh, you know, they have to have positive behavior intervention systems, you know, and uh, we know that the imbalance is still there. Um, recently, when I checked the numbers, about 20% of the teachers were t teachers of color, and the other 80% were all Anglos. So that has to change also, eventually. And now they have Hispanic Heritage Month, and they have Black History Month at the Kern High School District. Progress. <laughs> So we know how important education is. And the one thing that we do have to work for is to make sure 
that into our educational system that little boys and little girls can learn, starting from kindergarten, first grade, that boys and girls are equal, okay? We may not be as strong, but we are, mentally, educationally, we are as strong as they are. They have to learn about, you know, uh, civic engagement. There's a school down in Santa Ana, California, they have what they call a kinder caminata, where you have uh, kindergarten kids that do a march, and they have little hats on with the year that they're going to graduate. And they take them to the college to do this, to the community, community college. And then they have these different stations where you have a fireman, and you have a doctor, and you have a policeman, and you have a teacher, and the kids go through those stations so they can think about what they want to be when they grow up. And then after the end of the march, they all get to vote. They have a ballot box, and they can vote for Donald Duck, or Mickey Mouse, or Minnie Mouse, <laughs> and they can drop their ballots there. And that is such a great way to let little kids know that they can actually, you know, start voting at a very young age. Now, the other thing about our education is, and this is an important one, recently there were two scientists that got Nobel, the Nobel Peace Prize, and I was listening to their story, and they, the study that they did, and this is part of what they said, 70,000 years ago, they were studying the human race. They started 70,000 years ago where our human race began in Africa. In Africa. Think about that. Our human race, Homo sapiens, began in Africa. And we know that our human race went across the planet, got lighter in skin, different color hair, different color eyes. But at the end of the day, we are all Africans. Now, I want you to take the hand of the person next to you. I want you to take the hand of the person next to you. Take the hand of the person next to you. Turn to that person. And say to that person, hello, relative. And so we have to remember that, that we are one human race, okay? One human race, homo sapiens. And the only way that we survived on this planet is because we took care of each other, we supported each other, we protected each other, we shared whatever we had with each other. And that's how we survived. And the pandemic has taught us that also, right? that we really, really have to care about each other. And then we could say to the white supremacists, wherever you are, hey, get over it. You're Africans, okay? You're Africans, get over it. Enough already, enough of the hatred. We don't need that anymore. And when we think about the, the people, they hate people because they happen to be of a darker color, okay? or because they're gay, or transgender, you know? We think of those people, uh, and I'm gonna use the F word, not the one you think. It's fascism. Fascism. And uh, what, that word fascism comes from a German word, to hurt and to punish to hurt and to punish. And that is what we see that is happening in our society right now, that there are laws that have been, that have been passed, as you know, in Texas, that um, laws that have been passed in Texas that if a woman has an abortion, if some family member or friend tries to help her have an abortion, that actually, and the doctors, of course, that, that uh, do the abortion, that they are committing a criminal act. And, and not only Texas, they're passing these laws all over, all over, you know, and the idea that you can punish people because they are exercising their own human rights. 
And I do want to say a, 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 a little bit about that, okay? Uh, I happen to be the mother of 11 children. Uh, my daughter, Juanita, uh, who's a lesbian, she has a dog named Bruno and a cat named Junebug, and no kids. No kids at all, okay? She's not going to have any children. I respect my daughter's choice, and this is what we have to do. And you know, there's a great president of Mexico, Benito Juarez. Um, he was the first president after the independence from Spain, and he had a great saying, el respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz respecting other people's rights is peace. So, you know, I can't say to any woman in here or any family, you know, you should have 11 children like me, right? No, that's wrong. So we could not let politicians or religious leaders say to a woman that they can decide what a woman's gonna do with her own body. Nobody can do that but us. Nobody can do that but us. And the same thing applies to who you love, who you live with, or who you marry. If it happens to be somebody of your same sex, that's your human right, okay? So we have a lot of challenges ahead of us here. And you know Kern County? Sometimes people call this Kern County, Alabama. And well, you know, we talk, when I talked about the Liberty Institute, right, I kind of, kind of shows us people, there's so people out there that are part of the haters, I call, that's what I call them, the haters, right? They hate people because they happen to be darker in skin or because they're gay, you know, or because they're environmentalists, etc. So the thing is that when we talk about activism, we have to take responsibility of how and what we are going to do to challenge this. Kern County, we can be the microcosm of what's happening in many parts of the country. You know, right now we're trying to transition from oil to green energy. And this is something, climate, we have to stop global warming because not all of us are going to perish and we're not going to leave a planet for our children. So this is upon us. In Kern County, even though we have a lot of, uh, as we know, uh, fossil fuel, uh, uh, production that we have here, we're also the leaders in California on green energy. We are. So we have to continue that progress that we have. And one of the issues, I'm just gonna mention it, I'm, I'm not an expert on it, but we have a lot of people here that have already decided that they wanna do what they call the carbon sequestration. It's not a proven remedy for global warming and it can even be very, very dangerous for people if it's not done right, and there's a lot of money that's going to go in there to build the cylinders, and so we're gonna to have to work really hard to stop that, and we may come to all of you to help us in that. We're gonna invite all of you to become activists so we can stop this, okay? And we can do it together, and we know that we have to do it together. If not, we're not going to survive, and we can be the example, not only for the state of California, but for the whole United States of America. Oh, just recently, uh, here in, there were five of the oil companies that made profits this year, first and second quarter, $120 billion in profits, $120 billion. And I don't know how this happened in, in our country here, but who gave the right to private corporations to own our natural resources? You know, Norway, and as an example, Norway, the country of Norway, they own their oil. And what do they have that we don't have? Free college education, free health care, free daycare for, for the families. We don't have that in the United States because somehow the oil companies own our oil. Corporations like PG&E, that's a private corporation. They own our electricity. There are parts of California where people actually own the water, own the water, and this is wrong. But we, we know that the only way that we can change this is by electing people that are going to understand that this has to change. Because we do need free college education for everybody, we do need free healthcare for everyone, 
And yes, we also need daycare for all of the families so that we can have more people, and especially women, get more involved in activism. So, you know, this is what we have to do. So we're going to be taking some questions, but before we do that, I want to ask everybody to stand up for a quick second, if you could. Uh, some, of you, some of you know this routine already, I know. <laughs> so, the main thing that we have to remember is that we, as citizens of this country, we are fighting to save democracy right, right now, because we don't want fascism to take over our country. And we have to understand that we are the only ones that can do it. So I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. The first question I'm going to ask you is, who's got the power? And I want you to say, oh, wait for me. <laughs> I'm going to ask you who's got the power. I want you to say, we've got the power. And then I'm going to ask you, what kind of power? And I want you to say, people power, OK? People power. We can all become activists. Not only can we, but we have to because we have to save our democracy, all right? So, here it goes. Who's got the power? We got the power. Okay, let's do it one more time, so people aren't sure, okay? <laughs> Who's got the power? We got the power. What kind of power? People power. Or are we gonna go out there and use our power to save our democracy, to get out the vote, get everybody, including our exes, okay? Get everybody, everybody that we know, our neighbors, our friends, and everybody to come out and help us knock on doors, help us make those phone calls so that we can keep democracy alive. So I'm going to ask you one more thing, okay? Can we do this? What do we say? Yes. Okay. 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 So we'll say one more thing, and it's si se puede, which means, yes, I can. And yes, we can, working all together. Let's all do it all together with an organized hand clap. It means, yes, we can, yes, I can. In Spanish, si se puede. Let's go. Si se puede. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dolores. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you so much, Dolores. Uh, could I just say before we begin this sure. that I want to uh, introduce uh, the executive director of our foundation. Uh, Camila Chavez, my youngest daughter, the youngest of the 11. And she, by the way, she does all the work. She's the youngest, but she's our boss. So Dolores, thanks so much for your talk and your, and your thoughts and for sharing your wisdom and knowledge with us tonight. Um, I wanna, before we talk about a few questions, I actually wanna just talk about procedure. Um, so we have two very gracious student volunteers who are with us right here and right here. Um, they have microphones, um, which we need you to speak into when you ask your question so we can hear you and also so the live stream can hear your question as well. So if you have a question uh, for Dolores, and I'm sure you do, um, you can raise your hand high um, and I'll point you out and our student volunteers will kind of go up and down the aisles and pass the microphone to you. And when you're done, you can pass the microphone back to them. Um, as per tradition, I'd like to start our question and answer period with a couple questions from current students. Um, so I'd like to open the floor to questions from our CSUB students first, and then we can go from there. So let's say the first two questions from a CSUB student. I see a hand right there. So let's start there for Dolores. Thank you so much, Dolores, for speaking with us this evening. Glad to have you. My question related to the, um, the person you were speaking about in Lamont Weed Patch that brought criminal charges or investigation against the $250,000 that was missing. She definitely suffered some repercussions for that, and we know that's a real factor in being out there and you know expressing our power and advocating. 
how do you explain to us to overcome our fears of those repercussions? Well, we use that organizing method that Mr. Fred Ross Sr. taught us about meet, meeting people in their homes, uh, talking about the issues, and then showing them examples of how people like them have solved similar types of issues, and then getting them to commit. And when we do these house meetings, we say to them, do you want to change uh, these issues that you have in your community? They always say, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we say, well, would you like to have another meeting with some of your friends so that we can talk about this and get them convinced that they can do something too? And then that they get a little hesitant, but out of every single meeting that we have, uh, we get more people then to commit that they will have another meeting and another meeting and another meeting from four to six people, then get, we get them all together. Uh, before we sue the Kern High School District, our organizer, Timo, Timoteo Prado, he had many, many house meetings. And when we had our, when we brought all of the parents and the students together, there were actually 155 people in that meeting. And that's where we got the information on how to sue the Kern High School District because we got the students and the parents that were telling us about what was going on. So you have to get people to lose their fear. You know, people, because they're, people, it's, it's, it's natural, you know, people are, in, are inhibited. They don't think that you can, can do this. They don't think that they can go to a school board meeting or a city council meeting or go up to Sacramento and talk to some of the people up there, the people that are in power. And, but that's, what, that's the way we, we teach them. Well, like I mentioned before, when we started the Farmworkers Union, we did that for three years. For three years, meeting with the farm workers in their homes to take away their fear. That's that apathy that Helen Keller was talking about, okay? So, and it's just people always, uh, it's, they feel insecure. And what we say to people that before you go up there and before a city council meeting or a school board meeting, you have butterflies in your stomach, you know? and you get all of this anxiety, and it's natural because you're doing something different, something you've never done before. But once you go out there and you start talking, and you know that you're really not talking just for yourself but for others, and you're trying to make the change, then the anxiety, eventually, it will go down, okay? You might have a little bit, you know, still, like I was a little anxious when I got up there at the podium today, okay? You know, but eventually, you, know how, you learn how to handle that. And that's where you build what I mentioned before, emotional fortitude, your own strength within yourself. Because you know you're doing something good for others, doing something for your community, and that gives you kind of the, the backbone that you need, you know, the kind of strength and the energy that you need. Oh, and for the students here, I just want to quote Cesar Chavez. Cesar said, when you're going to college, you are studying about history, you're writing about history, you know, you're talking about history, but when you become an activist, you are making history. You are making history. Thank you, Dolores. Thank you for your question, too. I think we had a question right here from another student. So we can bring the microphone down this way. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, Dolores, I just want to say thank you for being here tonight and just being able to come and give your talk. Um, my question is, what advice do you have for the student leaders on campus on how to overcome apathy and find our power through activism? Well, thank you for that question. I kind of mentioned this a few moments ago, but I want to invite all of you to come out and knock on doors, okay? We, you know, we have an election going on right now. There's some people here, are, I hear our voter turnout is low in Kern County. So there's people out there right now that they're unsure about voting. There's some people out there that don't know how to mark their ballot, you know? And so because they don't, don't know how to mark, they think it's an examination. And we have to, it's not an exam. You know, you get out there and you inform yourself about the people that you want to vote for. And uh, by the way, and also don't listen to the lies that they tell. You know, they call it misinformation. I'm going to just call it lies. All right? Yeah, it's just lies, just straight outright lies that they tell about people. When my son was running for Congress uh, here 
in Kern County, my son, I, some of you might know him, Emilio Huerta. He's not an ugly person, but they made him look really ugly. And they actually, uh, they got a picture of him because he was a, a chopping down some trees there, the headquarters of the United Farm Workers up there in Keene. And he had a chainsaw where they were chopping down uh, the weeds and whatever. And they got a picture of my son with a chainsaw, but said he was threatening a woman with a chainsaw. I mean, that's how bad it was, how bad the lies were. So we have to tell people, don't believe the lies, you know? Look at the candidates, you know, like we have Rudy Salas right now, where he's such a decent human being. I mean, he really, really is. They can't really find any dirt on him because he doesn't have any. And so they're telling lies about him, and they're trying really hard to make him look bad, you know? They're having a hard time. But he has brought millions of dollars into Kern County for education, for health care, and, and also, how do we overcome the apathy? I want to invite all of you, please. We have a few days left. Come out and help us knock on doors, okay? Come out and help us knock on doors uh, to get good people elected uh, here uh, in Kern County. This is what we have to do. Uh, you know, democracy depends on this. You know, Abraham Lincoln said that the ballot is more powerful than the bullet, okay? The ballot is more powerful than the bullet. And I know a lot of young people say, well, I already marched, you know? You know, that's going to take care of everything, right? I protested. But unless the policies that we want are, are put into a law, a law that can be implemented, okay? A law that can be enforced and where people that are supposed to implement the law, they have to be held accountable. And if they're not doing what the law says, we need to get them out of office or get them fired, you know, if they have a public office. The one thing that Fred Ross taught us when we were organizing, every single public official works for who? Yeah, they work for us because we pay their tax dollars, you know? And our tax dollars pay their wages. I'm sorry, I misspoke on that one. Our tax dollars that we pay pay their wages. And so they have to be accountable to us. And a lot of people don't understand that. I'm not saying that you have to be rude or mean to a public person that is paid, but we have to remind them, hey, you work for me. You work for me, you work for me, okay? And that's one thing that we have to always remember that. Thank you. We have another student question right here, so I can just pass the microphone there. Hi, everyone, my name's Fatima. Dolores, thank you so much for being here. I have two questions. Um, so my first one is, what advice do you have for students to help them find their voice? And also, what advice do you have for students on how to be comfortable with being uncomfortable? Well, for the first one, I'm gonna tell you how I found, I found my voice, okay? And I was a Girl Scout for 10 years, you know. I used to dance in public and whatever, when, when I was a, a, a teenager. Uh, so I wasn't afraid to be out in public, but when we started organizing, one day in our office, um, a man came in and he was, he was crippled, he was on a crutch. He had had a stroke. One side of his body was paralyzed and he was trying to get some public assistance, you know, because he was disabled. And so Mr. Ross was there in the office with me, so I took him down to the welfare office in Stockton to see if he could apply for disability. And the woman there would not let him make an application. So I drove back to the office there, and I told Mr. Ross, they won't let this man make an application to get public assistance. Mr. Ross said to me, you go right back down there to that office, and you demand to see a supervisor. You want to talk to his supervisor? And I thought, I can do that? <laughs> so now Mr. Ross didn't say, I'm going to call them and tell them that you're going. He didn't say, I'm going to give you a note. He said, you go down there. And so I went back to the welfare office down there with Mr. Mr. Reese, I think his name was, and uh, I said, I demand to see a supervisor, okay? And he came out. <laughs> and so I explained what happened, that they would not let this man make an application and he was visibly disabled. And so they said, of course, he, of course we have to let him make an application. Well, I felt really good because I found my voice, but what happened then, 
we found out that that person that had denied him was denying a lot of people of color for making an application, okay? So I found, I found my voice that day. So that's what it basically means, that you have to just get that, that inner strength, you know, that courage. And sometimes when you're not feeling it, just pretend, okay? <laughs> pretend that you're out there. Pretend that you're Cesar Chavez. <laughs> and, you know, go out there and make that demand of people. You know, because that way, uh, that, that's the way that we do it. To know that we have the power, okay? We have the power and we have the voice. And what was the second question? The second question was, how do you become uncomfortable with being uncomfortable, like, as you're engaging in activism and in leadership pursuits? How do you become comfortable being uncomfortable? Thank you for that correction. Well, I mentioned before about the anxiety that one feels. And the thing is that, we, that when we get that anxiety, we can't give into it. And I kind of like, you know, like when you're exercising, you know how your muscles hurt? But you don't stop exercising because your muscles hurt. In fact, when your muscles hurt, you know you're doing it right. Yeah? And so it's the same thing when you get that anxiety. You just keep on going in spite of the anxiety. And eventually, those butterflies, you know, they get less and less and less. You know, they get less and less and less. Uh, so it, it, it's about building kind of our moral courage our moral courage that we need. Because you know, you're not just speaking up for yourself, you're speaking up for people in your, in your community, you're speaking up for women, you're speaking up for children, you know, you're speaking up for justice, right? You're speaking up for justice. And just think about that when you do what, that, what we need to do. The other questions, we'll open this up to, to anybody. I see a hand back in the back there. Uh, first off, I just want to say thank you, Dolores, for being here. It's been a great experience, especially coming from um, us being in social work. So when, our, my question is, when discussing fear, I think a lot of us have a fear of failing or failing to make a difference. So my question is, can you share an advocacy effort that didn't go as planned and what that looked like? An advocacy effort. So can you share an advocacy um, uh, movement that you were participating in that didn't go as planned, like a failure, and, and how you, what you learned from that and how you persevered? Well, just recently uh, here in Kern County, uh, the Dolores Huerta Foundation, uh, first of all, we knew the census was coming, right? So we signed up 84,000 people in the census. 84,000 people. And from the census, then we get redistricting. And our team uh, actually had a lot of surveys, about 3,000 participant and communities of interest so that we could get representation of people of color here in Kern County, okay? And uh, I do want to say that one of the leaders of our, of our work there, uh, our civic work is here with us, Lori Posante. Uh, and, uh, the, and the demographer who drew our maps is Jesus Garcia. So they, they did about, they did presentations, they took the, uh, the community surveys and the hearings that they had all up and down the valley, and we got some new districts, okay? We got an additional congressional district, we got an additional senate district uh, for people of color, you know? And this is what it's all about, it's about people fighting for their own representation to get people that look like them, that have the same interests as them, that have the same values as them. And that was done with just people doing the groundwork, okay? Our people had to go out there and to get, beg people, please sign up for the census. A lot of people were afraid, because at that time, you know, our former uh, person who, who was in the White House <laughs> was trying to scare people and telling them not to sign up for the census, especially if they were immigrants. And, uh, but you know, we were able to get 84,000 people. And the result of that is that now we have more people of color running uh, to represent us. And recently, with our legislative work, because uh, the redistricting only applies, uh, because we have an independent commission, as you know, in California. And, but it only applies to assembly seats and senate seats and congressional seats. But we passed a law in the state legislature that for the next census, guess what? The Board of Supervisors are going to have an independent commission here in Kern County. So maybe we can get more representation there. Oh, and by the way, we have uh, the first uh, uh, woman, Sikh woman, Manfred, 
who is running for the city council here, uh, the first person of Indian descent from India who is running uh, for city council here in Kern County, in Bakersfield, Bakersfield, California. So we have a hand here from one of our young friends. I was asking, like, how do I know what my rights are? And what do I do to get them? So, yes. so she asks, um, how do I know what my rights are and how do I get those rights? How do I know what my rights are and how do I get those rights? Well, we have a lot of rights here in our country, and some of our, our rights have been taken away from us, like I mentioned before, right? So, um, how do you know what your rights are? I think, first of all, think of yourself as a human being. You have a lot of rights, and uh, you have to fight for your rights. And if you see, well, we have the right to public education, right? That's one of the rights that we have. Now, right now, a lot of people want to intrude on our public education, and they, one, of, one of the ways that they're doing this is by trying to bring in charter schools uh, where they can control the curriculum and some of the uh, stuff that they don't want. They don't want to teach the history of slavery. Uh, they don't want to teach, uh, and I do like to say to people, Google a map of the United States before 1848. And what will you see? That one third of the United States was Mexico. This is why we're called California. <laughs> And uh, actually, during the Mexican-American War, the United States took 50% of Mexico became the United States of America. 50% of Mexico, you know? And uh, when we see people at our borders that are, are seeking refuge here in the United States, well, these are the indigenous people of the continent, right? This land was theirs, you know? This, this land was theirs. And we think, well, why are people trying to get into our country? They're escaping poverty. They're escaping violence. And I, I have to say this. How many bananas do we eat every day? One. Jillions, right? <laughs> Throughout the country, jillions of bananas. The, the money that we pay for bananas, does it go to the people in Guatemala? No. Or El Salvador? No. Honduras? It goes to United Fruit Company. Chiquita banana. It goes to Dole Banana, okay? So the people in those countries do not get the money that we pay for the fruit and the coffee that they make. Can you imagine if they got that money? They would be so wealthy, so wealthy. And then in the 80s, we had wars in Central America. We intruded in there, and we never went back to clean up the mess, okay? So we have... Again, when we read that book, The Open Veins of Latin America, you see how much we in the United States owe to our Latin American uh, uh, brothers and sisters over there. You know, these are the things that we have to change. And I don't know if that answered your question over there, but we should say this. Human rights are for all people, right? All people have human rights, and we have to fight really hard to make sure that we can keep those rights. Right now, the, the, the Supreme Court you know, what they did on the whole issue of women's right to abortion, say, leaving it up to the states, okay? Now, in California, we know we have Proposition 1 on the ballot, and that is to make women's right to abortion part of the Constitution of California, all right? That's an important one. That, that's important. Uh, but we know that in other states, people's rights are being taken away from them. Oh, and right now, the Supreme Court is talking, what, about affirmative action? I mean, really? I mean, we're just barely, barely trying to open the door for poor people, people of color, to get a quality education that they have been denied for centuries, you know? And now the Supreme Court is trying to take that away from us, you know? So these are the human rights that we have to fight for. And one of the ways that we can do that, sending an email uh, to our congressperson or to our state senator, that only takes a few minutes to do that, right? It only takes a few minutes to do that. And showing up uh, at a school board meeting and to insist that they teach our history, the history of slavery, you know, that that has to be taught in our school so that people know that the White House and the Congress were built by African slaves, okay? People don't know that. 
and our indigenous people who were the first slaves. You know, like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, racism is an illness and we have to cure it. And the way we cure that is through education and fighting for our human rights. So we have time for a few more questions. If there's any other questions, so I see one here and then we have one back there. So that's First of all, thank you so much for being here. Uh, really, really honored to listen to you. And uh, also, I'm, I'm so grateful that my kids get to hear you yearly at Voorhees. I have three children that have gone through there or that attend there right now. Thank you. Um, sometimes it feels like, it, well, we live in a very tumultuous time, and it can be overwhelming with all the problems we have currently in the US. If you were to and we can feel there's so many different things we need to fight and it can be hard to know which ones matters the most. If you were to prioritize one or two things that you think we can be doing uh, of, the, of the problems we have in the US, which ones would you put as highest priority? Well, right now I think the scariest thing that we have happening is what would happen on January the 6th, you know, when we had people that were trying to overturn the election of President Biden, and we saw that people were killed there. I don't think any of us would have ever thought that we would ever see that in our lifetime. We saw what happened to Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, who has passed more legislation than any other speaker before her, you know, while she has been the Speaker of the House. And when you see that there are people that are making fun of her husband, after he was hit in the head with a hammer. I mean, really, really, you know. And the, as I said before, the misinformation, they call it misinformation, I call it outright lies that they are telling the American people. I think this is the biggest danger that we have right now because everything else comes out of that, you know. The, and the common denominator of all of these, I'm gonna call them haters, okay, is, is the racism. The racism against immigrants, you know, against people of color, the hatred against people that are gay. Like the governor of Florida, he says he's anti-woke. Really? That means you're anti-education. You, you want people to stay ignorant. And there was a Spanish philosopher, his name was Jose Ortega y Gasset, and this is what he said. If you do not have an educated citizenry, that's all of us, right? If you do not have an educated citizenry, the powerful, the greedy, and the corrupt will rule and govern. That's where we're at right now. Why do we not have a free college education? Why do we not have universal health care? Why do we not have universal daycare for our children? Because in the United States of America, 10% of the wealthy families like Walmart, and the wealthy corporations control 90% of the wealth of the United States of America. 90% of the wealth. We're the richest country in the world. So this has to change because we cannot tolerate seeing people in the streets that are homeless, seeing that we do not have money, enough money for our teachers or for our students. This has to change. We can't go on like this. We can't go on like this. And the only way that we can change that is by us, okay? All of us here. All of us here voting for people that are going to change that. And one of the things that hardly anybody talks about this, public financing. There is no reason why people that are running for office have to spend all of their time raising money for the next election. And, and that we wonder why people are corrupted. That's why, you know, because they're, they're out there in Sacramento or they're in Washington and they got all these oil lobbyists, they got the real estate lobbyists, they got the insurance lobbyists, you know, the pharmaceuticals, the big pharma, you know, that, that are putting the pressure on them. So we, as ordinary citizens, we have to advocate and we have to put the pressure on them also. But if we, have, if we can pay for people to run for office, and we could have a little bit come out of our page of our taxes, you know, all of us together, then they don't have to be on the phone raising money and, and, and be beholden to somebody else. It, the, the citizens, and we are the ones that can pay for their elections. Think about that. We have to start doing that. 
We have to start doing that and stop the corruption and make sure that we can get people like yourselves who can run for office, okay? Like I mentioned, Leticia Prado, right? Who ran for the school board and, and ran for the water board. We can all do it. So I saw a hand back here. Okay. Hello. Okay. Dolores, you speak about the rise in fascism in the U.S. and mention U.S. imperialism and exploitation of the global south, yet you still have meetings with Democrats like Obama, and Obama is known to have caused a lot of harm under his presidency, such as the two million deportations and the coups that took place in Central America and Africa. Um, do you ever think you're contradicting yourself to what you're, about what you're saying, but also working with the democratic politicians and the party? Okay. Uh, yes, and actually uh, we met with President Obama when he was president of the, in the White House to talk about those issues. And somewhere, when the Newt Gingrich was his name, uh, the Republican, they passed some kind of a law in the Congress that they had to have so many immigration beds filled, okay, with people. And so that's why they were always saying the INS was out there, you know, trying to always uh, deport people and, you know, getting people arrested and doing all those deportations. And at that point in time, too, I know that Obama had a hard time uh, because he didn't always have the Congress with him on many of these issues. And so it's something that we have to keep working on. I, uh, many of you, I'm sure in this room, or some of you, I should say, probably know people that got their legalization in 1986 under the amnesty bill. People have friends, maybe, that got that. Oh, I was in Washington, D.C. for four months working on that bill to pass it. Senator Kennedy, Ted Kennedy, may he rest in peace. Senator Schumer, who was then in the House of Representatives. Peter Rodino from New Jersey, Howard Berman from California. They are the poor uh, Democrats that pushed to pass that bill. And we were able to get uh, several uh, million people got their legalization, you know, got their legalization under that bill. Uh, Ronald Reagan kind of got the credit because he signed it. But he did nothing to pass it. We had to put a lot of pressure on him. We had to get growers from Georgia, Louisiana, Florida, uh, many states to put pressure on Reagan to sign that bill. And, and we can do that again. We can get another amnesty bill. And it's long overdue. And we have to remember, again, nation of immigrants, right? Yeah, my great-grandmother, one of my great-grandmothers came from Spain. Jesusita. Uh, Baena, Maria Jesusita Baena. One of my great grandfathers came from England, Marshall St. John. So, so they are the immigrants to the United States of America, okay? They are the real immigrants to the United States of America. And it has always been the policy of the United States to have those people that came here to become citizens, right? It's not a new policy. It's always been the policy of the United States of America. So who is more entitled to become a citizen of this country than the indigenous people who are the people of the continent, right? And those are the people are, are, that are, are at our borders. And for many, many years, our immigration uh, policies were to open the doors for people from Europe, because they're Anglos, right? And to close the door on people that came from Latin America or from Africa or from Asia, okay? So we have to remember this history. That's why education is so important, because we really cannot correct the wrongs of the past if we don't, do not know how those policies of the past affect us today. But yeah, what you were saying, I think Obama probably could have done better you know, on the immigration issue than what he did, but that doesn't take away from all of the other Democrats that have been working so hard. And even here in California, under Governor Gavin Newsom, and we don't always agree with him. You know, we have, we have arguments with go our governor. Um, but they, he and the state legislature of California 
and again starting with Jerry Brown, that they passed a law that our uh, undocumented people in California are, have health care, right? Under our California Medi-Cal plan. And in 2024, it's going to cover everybody. All undocumented people in California are going to have health care. Oh, just let, let me say a little thing to you about that we know millions of people in the United States have benefited from our affordable, the Affordable Care Act, which was passed under who? Obama. Obama, okay? But do you know that it only passed with a handful of votes? Uh, passed with a handful of votes. And we had two of our congressmen here, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna call them out, okay? Yeah. Okay, Jim Costa was one of them, uh, Cardoza from Stanislaus County, they were going to vote against the bill. They were not going to vote for health care. But what, what did we do? We got hundreds of postcards. We had a press conference. We had picket lines. We did sit-ins in their offices, OK? And then we had a fast. And we got about 500 people to do a fast to get them to, 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 sign, to, to, to support the bill. And they did. Okay, yeah. But that's the kind of activist work, and that's the kind of work that we have to do to change things. But can you imagine a handful of votes? And that's what's happening in this election right now. They're saying that the Senate is probably going to be have Democrats elected because there's a, a lot of election deniers, a lot of women haters that are running for the Senate. So they're saying that the Senate were probably going to go for the Democrats. But the House of Representatives is very, very iffy, okay? Remember the Affordable Care Act? It passed, I think, with four or five votes. Can you imagine that? They could have been denied. So that's how close everything is. So again, I want to repeat what Camila said. Uh, there's people out in the back there that will sign you up, okay? So that you can really get your activism going on, all right? Get your activism going on and come out there and help us knock on the doors to make sure we get good people elected. All of us have to do this, all right? Democracy doesn't work until, unless each and every one of us participate. And it's fragile. We could lose it. We could have it. dictators, you know, like they had in Nazi Germany and in Mussolini and all these other places in Italy. We have to save our democracy, all right? We're the only ones that can do it. And we've got six days right now ahead of us to make it happen. Si se puede. So that's the, the time we have for tonight. Um, I want to thank, first of all, Dolores Huerta for being with us and coming here directly from the airport and being with us tonight. Um, and I want to thank our student volunteers uh, for helping us out tonight. And also mostly just thanks so much to all of you for being with us tonight, spending an hour and a half thinking, learning, and talking. So thanks so much for being with us. And we'll see you again sometime soon. Thank you.